Can I say the campaign for to end the sanctions, the U.S. and Canadian sanctions on Venezuela against Venezuela? It's the organization that uh, sent Steve here. This is Steve Elner. He's been teaching in, in uh, Venezuela at universities there since 1977. Right. Yeah. Been on the faculty there. He's researched left movements and the Chavista government. I right. Yeah. And married a Venezuelan, has kids there, and so on. Um, so he's come, he's on a, been on a tour for a month uh, in the United States to bring us information about what's the effect when the United States, Canada, when they put sanctions on a country. Particularly on Venezuela, what's been the impact of it? <clears throat> I want to point out that in the last two and a half uh, weeks, we had three visitors come from Latin America, uh, and we probably get about five all year. So it's been kind of an intense time. And on top of that, the caravan, about seven thousand over seven thousand Hondurans, decided that they were going to try to get here too. Um, so I'm with the Portland Central America Solidarity Committee, and we're hosting this here. And we've all, it's also sponsored by the um, International League of People's Struggle. Well, for some reason, I don't think they ever officially got around to the Workers World Party. But we're here. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> uh, and Fire. What 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 does that stand for again? Uh, fight for uh, immigrants. So Rights okay, so that, that's everywhere. more that's sort of focuses on the immigrant activity. Yeah, so we're concerned about that. And uh, Jobs of Justice, Portland Jobs of Justice, and uh, let's see, I had it on the sign-up sheet. I think I might be forgetting something. Um, <clears throat> so, one thing I'd like to tell, we, Portland, uh, PCAS was invited to a high school class the, the last week, and Russell and I went. And during that class, it, it was a class with, about Spanish, Social Studies and Creative Expression. So Mike Crenshaw was a teacher with that, and there was a Spanish teacher there named Ursula. One of the students, when talking about the situation in Latin America, uh, spoke about the people of somewhere as they. And Ursula, Ursula, who's from Peru, said, you know, when you call us they, I forget whether she, what she, I feel, and I forget whether she said offended or hurt or, or separated. And I think it's, I'm, I'm going to try to adopt that attitude that we, we are the people of this planet and most of us just want to live with our families and our friends and our communities. And then there are those who want to dominate and exploit and extract and we need to be together or we're all going to get taken to the cleaners. <laughs> you know? And that's where the fulfillment, for me, the fulfillment in life comes in. So um, we've had visitors this year from Cuba, Nicaragua. Honduras, and now Venezuela. And you notice those are all people who are under attack by this monster, the military corporate complex. So I hope we can uh, learn what we can and see how to pull it together. <clears throat> so the people in these countries have asked us to go to our Congress, to our government, to, like, the people in Honduras said, please get, tell your government to stop sending money to our military. Well, you know, that's a little naive, telling them doesn't stop it. Um, but, okay, we try, we try to get those people who are supposed to be progressive and supposed to represent us to do it. It's really difficult. This last week, one representative, Jan Schakowsky, who co-led a letter about protecting human rights defenders, journalists, and international observers from attacks on Honduras, issued her own statement describing the hell in response to the caravan. She said, these people come from, and she described the hell they went to, and, and she said, and that's exacerbated by the government. She didn't come right out and said, say that the government and, this, and the economic system is what's driving this hell. But she said they were making it as worse, bad as possible. And then she said, the Trump administration and the State Department are supporting this government every step of the way. And I think the, we, we can expect anybody who represents us to come out and say that. And they're not. Like, we get these folks to issue statements, like Merkley's issued a couple, after the elections, the 
condition, and he issued one with Schakowsky, and they, they said in that joint statement, the conditions, uh, the management of the elections in Honduras is very concerning. <laughs> they didn't say the United States government is driving this corruption. You know, and I think we need to get, if anybody represents us in Congress, we need to get them to where they will say that. And then we get some legislation going. But that's kind of, to me, the test. And so I've been going to meetings every, every Tuesday at one of the other of our sen senators' offices. And that's an so indivisible organ is holding them. And they get about 40 people there, maybe, 30, 40. And they, they lobby with them. And so the, the, those folks, I think, are, should be open to grasping that the United States government is a problem and getting our, we should be able to get some allies. So anyhow, that's kind of what, I, what I'm pushing for. Uh, let's see. I guess I've introduced you a little bit. Maybe you want to say whatever more that's you a, want. But, a, and, oh, one thing I want to point out is Megan Heise is here. And PCAST got started in 1979, and in the 80s, we were going over fences and everything, protesting the U.S. intervention in Central America. And I point out, the people of Honduras said, we're not ready for a revolution. Uh, one, one of our members said she, they were too scared then. By 2009, when the U U.S. supported a military coup, they were ready. They got themselves ready. And, but obviously, we've got a ways to go. But you can tell us a little bit about what PCAST did in the meantime. Okay. Just, just a, you know, just whatever you want to say about the. Oh yeah, well, um, I'd love to hear uh, a little bit from Steve, and then maybe we can okay. uh, riff off some ideas um, from the solidarity work that PCAST was doing um, if from like roughly 2005 to I don't know 2009, 10, um, and and find some ideas from the hands off Venezuela campaign uh, that was active then. Um, but I'd love to hear more. I feel pretty. I was in Venezuela <clears throat> um, in 2006 and 7, um, and worked on uh, a three delegations that PCAS did to Venezuela and Colombia at the time to kind of expose the difference in models but between the two countries. And um, but I feel really checked out um, and not connected to the grassroots movements. Right. Now. A lot has changed. And a lot of, and a lot has changed. I feel like I feel like so much has changed. So I'm really really curious to hear your your thoughts okay. tonight. Um, wait, just one thing. I want to apologize for not having to go around. It looks like there's a lot of us. It might take a while, but can we just name some of the organizations here? Workers World and POTS from Surge and LPS. LPS. PLS. Pardon me. Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm just here, <laughs> in my own name. <laughs> and, and we haven't seen you of these before, I don't think? No, oh, I came um, through the PSL. And what? Through the PSL. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, well, um, I think the best place to begin is to just make one central point about Venezuela, uh, which goes completely contrary to what Trump is saying and what most of the corporate media is saying and what the Venezuelan opposition is saying. And that is what is happening in Venezuela in the last 10 years since you were there uh, is complex. And I think that that's the point that really has to be emphasized because um, uh, I, I don't defend everything that the Venezuelan government says and does. I'm critical. Uh, but I think it's important to emphasize uh, that along with the downsides, along with the economic crisis, for instance, 
I mean, some of the errors that the Venezuelan government has, has made, that there are also positive aspects. But I, I think that the point of departure to understand um, and to refute Trump's uh, narrative that Venezuela is a failed state uh, is to ask the question, how do you explain the fact that the Chavistas, in other words, Chavez and, and Maduro, have been in power for such an extended period of time, 20 years? I mean, that, that is really amazing when you think of it. It's amazing for Venezuela, and it's amazing for any, any Latin American country, and it's amazing for the United States. I mean, what, what president in the United States um, has been in power for such an extended period of time? Only one was elected more than twice, and that was Roosevelt. Uh, he died in office. Uh, he was president for, well, 13 years. The Chavistas have, have been in power for, for almost 20. And there's reason for that. Uh, you could say that a populist demagogue could get elected once, but the Chavistas have held elections for over 20 years. I'm, I'm sorry, over 20 times. And they have won all but two of those elections. Um, so that has to be explained. And I think that uh, in order to understand that, uh, we have to compare these 20 years, uh, nearly 20 years, with what came before that, before Chavez was elected the first time in 1998. That was a period, the 1990s was a period of neoliberalism. And uh, during that period of time, the Venezuelan economy basically ceased to be Venezuelan. Uh, sector after sector was either privatized and all the privatization went over to foreign capital, but there was a, a wave of privatization, as well as important companies, industries in the private sector that were also sold out to, to foreign multinational corporations. So you had, for instance, steel, which was the pride of Venezuelans because it was you know, a state company to the 1950s uh, uh, and that was privatized in 1997. You had telecommunications which was taken over by the state in the 1950s also and that was privatized <coughs> in 1991. You had electricity which was also, incidentally, telecommunications was eventually bought out by Verizon. So before Chavez nationalized telecommunications. Verizon ran, ran the, uh, uh, the telephone company, uh, Cantaver. Uh, uh, electricity was also privatized and sold to a U.S. company. Um, uh, the aluminum industry was about to be privatized. In fact, the government was attempting to privatize it when Chavez took, took office. And the same thing with Social Security. The whole Social Security system was being privatized. Um, in the private sector, cement uh, was owned by the Rockefeller of Venezuela, Eugenio Mendoza. He died in the 80s, and a Japanese company, and then Cemex of Mexico, bought the cement company, the, the main cement company. Uh, Venezuelan chocolate, Savoy, which is also the pride of Venezuela, perhaps the best chocolate in the world, that was bought by Nestle. Um, so that you had, you know, the, practically the entire transfer of the Venezuelan economy, unlike other Latin American countries where privatization meant um, uh, multinationals but also national capital uh, bought state companies. But in the case of Venezuela, in the case of Peru, those two countries and, and a few others, the privatization was, uh, did not involve private uh, national capital, it was foreign capital. And so, Chavez comes along with a nationalistic discourse, and there was this, you know, feeling that uh, Chavez was going to return the economy and return the society to Venezuela, um, and so that had a lot to do with the fact that Chavez is an outsider, won those elections. You know, when there's discontent, and there was in Venezuela in the past. Uh, another party, a pro-establishment party, would replace that party. Very similar to the United States with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. It goes back and forth. Well, in the case of um, Venezuela, it was the same thing. It was basically a two-party system there for a while. And it was between AD and Copay. So 
how do you explain the fact that an outsider, somebody who was not associated with the establishment, who had led a military coup, an unsuccessful military coup just six years before that, uh, won those elections, and not only won the elections, but they won the elections by, uh, Chavez won by 50, he received 56% of the vote. And the other main candidate, the candidate that received about 38%, uh, was also an outsider. He didn't belong to either AD or Copic. So when the Venezuelan opposition today, and a lot of Venezuelans who you'll meet, uh, students, for instance, who are very, very adamantly anti-government, uh, you hear them say, you know, before Chavez came along, we lived well. Venezuela was a nice place to live. And one of the things, which I won't get into, but one of the things that they allege is that you didn't have racism in Venezuela until Chavez came along and played that card. And so he drummed up this, you know, um, uh, the, 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 this narrative that uh, the people of color uh, has been have been have been discriminated against before you know Venezuela was a racial paradise. That's a myth, which I, I won't get into. But the fact of the matter is that Venezuela was hardly a paradise at all. It was a boom economy in the 1970s when I arrived in 1975, and it is true that people lived well, and the narrative today that everything was hunky-dory before Chavez came to power in 1998, people tend to hark back to the 1970s when there was a lot of nouveau riche and you know, a lot of lower middle class people who became middle class or even upper middle class, poor people lived better, etc. But that was in the 1970s. The price of oil, and Venezuela has always been dependent on the oil since the 1920s, declined in the early 80s. And uh, so the situation in the 80s and the 90s was quite distinct from what many people in the opposition describe. Uh, there was another thing that Chavez did that Chavez was associated with, which explains his popularity and his extended popularity. And that is something that's kind of hard for us to grasp. I certainly <clears throat> had a hard time understanding it when I first arrived to Venezuela. I was doing research on organized labor. And the system of severance payment, in Spanish it's called prestaciones sociales. I didn't even know what the word, you know, when I arrived to Venezuela and I was interviewing people and doing field work for my dissertation, uh, I got a feel for how important. I mean, for Venezuelans, it was almost as important as salary. Severance payment. And it was a system that went back to 1936, the beginning of the modern period in Venezuelan history. And the person that uh, drafted that legislation, it was the, the labor law of 1936, the co-author of that was the president in the 1990s, Rafael Caldera. And he eliminated that system, his own baby, 1936. He eliminated the system in which severance payment is calculated on the basis of your last, sa your last salary. That for Venezuelan uh, workers was a real sellout. <coughs> the um, labor movement, when that was <coughs> first discussed in the early 90s, the uh, pro-establishment labor movement <coughs> uh, stated that they would not even discuss the issue, that that was sacred. But they sold out. Influenced by the political parties that they belonged to, those labor leaders went along with the reform in, 1930, in 1997. And it was really obvious to anybody in Venezuela that you had a real divide. The working class, the workers, all of them, were opposed to the elimination of that system. And the labor leaders of the main political parties, the leaders that ran the main labor confederation, the CTV, they all supported it. So you had this incredible divide between the workers and their leaders. And Chavez, who was just beginning his campaign uh, and for the 1998 elections, uh, 
participated, if I remember correctly, participated in a march. He opposed that reform. So Chavez comes to power in 1998, and what does he do? He puts a halt to the privatization. He doesn't privatize aluminum. He doesn't privatize Social Security. And he does something that I think is very important that has to be analyzed, uh, because I think it's uh, a lesson to come out of this 20-year, two-decade experience. And then Chavez waited. He knew when to act. He was re-elected president in 2006. In 2006, he, he received 63% of the vote, which is the highest percentage for any presidential candidate in the modern democratic period in Venezuela. And so he took advantage of the upper hand that he had vis-a-vis -vis the opposition. And those companies that had been privatized and bought up by foreign capital in the 1990s, he nationalized. He nationalized steel, he nationalized uh, electricity, he nationalized telecommunications from Ver Ver Verizon. Uh, and with regard to those companies that I mentioned that had been private, like uh, cement, had been private but bought out by foreign capital. And the big banks, which had been bought out by Spanish banks, specifically uh, Banco Santander and Banco Bilbao Vizcaya, uh, had bought out Venezuelan banks. The oldest bank in Venezuela, Banco de Venezuela, and the biggest bank, perhaps, uh, Banco Provincial. And Chavez nationalized the oldest bank in Venezuela, Bank of Venezuela. So you had this sensation that now the Venezuelan economy is Venezuelan again. So I think that <coughs> explains in part Chavez's popularity and explains why Maduro uh, has not been toppled in spite of everything that the opposition has done, in spite of these sanctions, etc. Because Maduro has maintained, Maduro has retained the policies and the strategies um, that, the, that Chavez implemented. He hasn't going over to neoliberalism, which a lot of progressive presidents do in situations of economic difficulty. They cave in, they go to the center, they, they, they make deals uh, with big economic groups. He, Maduro hasn't done that. So I think that's part of the explanation. And what I said about severance payment, uh, there was a lot of controversy. A lot of people in the Chavez movement felt that when they eliminated that system of severance payment that I mentioned, that that was a mistake, but it was a fait accompli, and at least for now, we can't go back to the old system. But in 2012, in late 2011, Chavez created a commission that Maduro, who was the foreign minister, but was a labor leader, he comes from the labor movement from the 1980s, 1990s, and he was the, the, the main labor leader, the main Chavista labor leader when Chavez was elected president in 98. He headed a commission that drafted a new labor law that reestablished that system of severance payment. So these are specifics that you don't get in any kind of analysis of Venezuela. You, don't, you certainly don't get it from the establishment media, meeting. And you, know, you don't get it from the Chavistas either. Because there's a lot of emphasis on Chavez was, you know, the friend of the poor. Chavez <coughs> implemented programs, and that meant benefits for the poor. That's true. He did. But it seems to me that you've got to go beyond that. You've got to talk about the specifics in terms of the concrete things that were done and how those policies that, and laws that were enacted um, struck a responsive chord among the Venezuelan people because it wasn't something that just came from the sky. For instance, these companies that I mentioned that Chavez nationalized, these are considered in Venezuela strategic sectors of the economy. That's a term that goes way back in time. And a lot of parties supported that the parties were was the state should run the strategic sectors. 
Venezuela is capitalist. We're not, we're not proposing socialism. But the strategic sectors of the economy have to be state-run because the private sector is incapable of providing those basic goods and services. So it, this was a general feeling. Not all the political parties supported the, this, this position, but it was incorporated in the Constitution of 1961 and was supported by the three main parties, pro-establishment, more or less, parties, plus the Communist Party. The four, main, the four <coughs> parties in Venezuela in 1961 supported that state control of what's known as basic industry, basic, basically the strategic sectors of the economy. So Chavez comes along and he makes that a reality. Okay? So I think that that point has to be made. Um, and uh, so let's um, go fast forward and talk about when Chavez passed away in 2000. And 13. Firstly, there was a period there in which there was somewhat of a power vacuum. Because Chavez, after he, he was re-elected president for the fourth time, Chavez was elected four times president. Shortly after that, he announced that he was going to go to Cuba for medical treatment. Uh, and it looked like it, people weren't sure what Chavez's state was like, but there was a lot of speculation that this was it. He wasn't going to survive. And he passed away in March of 2013. So there's a period there between late 2012 and when Maduro was elected president in April of 2013. And during that, that period of a, more or less a power vacuum, the price of the dollar skyrocketed. That's another thing that's difficult for people to understand because we don't have that system of exchange controls in the United States. Um, but it's a system that goes back, actually, to 1983 in Venezuela. And it was discontinued under the neoliberalism of the 1990s. But Chavez reestablished it in 2003. And it's a system in which basically in Venezuela, under Chavez, you had the official exchange rate at 4.3 bolivares to the dollar, and the black market rate, in other words, somebody who could not buy dollars at the official rate, because it wasn't that easy, the black market rate was double that, approximately. But when Chavez went off to Cuba, and Maduro was acting president, but really not the president, and everybody was looking at Chavez, Maduro hadn't really consolidated his authority. The ratio got out of hand, and the, the, um, un the unofficial rate, the black market rate, rate skyrocketed. So instead of a 2 to 1 ratio, it became 5 to 1, 7 to 1, 10 to 1, and that meant a lot of problems, big problems for Venezuela. Uh, problems uh, with regard to imports, problems with regard to corruption, because who, who gets those preferential dollars? If the preferential dollars are limited, and in 2014 the price of, the do of, the, of oil nosedived, so the government has limited dollars, and so that lends itself to a situation of corruption. Let me add that one of the uh, aspects of the narrative of the opposition is that the corruption is uh, consists of companies that are Chavista companies that uh, are getting those preferential dollars. And there are serious um, empirical studies um, by uh, Gavasut, Luis Enrique Gavasut, um, Pascalina Curcio, who's uh, uh, an economist at a very prestigious university in Venezuela, that demonstrate that that's a lie that multinational corporations have benefited, um, corporations that belong to the Chamber of Commerce, which is anti-Chavez, anti-Maduro. So it's not, it's not Chavista business people who are getting those dollars. But in any case, uh, there's corruption, and the government is responsible for the corruption. Uh, but it's not that you just have 
Chavista business people, known in Venezuela as the Boli Burguesi. It's a term that's used, mm -hmm. that they're the ones that are uh, raking it in. That's a lie. Um, so, Maduro was elected president in April of 2013. The opposition did not recognize those results. And the candidate that lost, and he didn't lose by much, uh, made a statement the night of the elections, we don't recognize these results. But this is something that the opposition has done all along, and it continues to do it. Basically, the opposition claims that there's corruption after the elections. But when they're, when they're participating in the elections, they say just the opposite. Because if they tell people this system is rigged, their people won't vote. And their people will say, if it's rigged, why are you running? They want to win. They want to get their gubernatorial candidates elected. They want to get their candidates for mayor elected. So they participate. But when the Chavistas win, they cry corruption. The f first time this happened was in 2004. The Carter Center was in Venezuela. Jimmy Carter was in Venezuela. I saw him on TV. Jennifer McCoy, who is the, was the head of the Carter Center's Latin American department, I know her very well. I know her works. I reviewed one of her books. She co-edited. She is as anti-Chavez as you can get. Very professional, but she's anti-Chavez. <laughs> Jennifer McCoy said, these elections are valid. James Carter, Jimmy Carter, said, we have observed 90-some elections. The Carter Center has observed 90 elections throughout the world, 90, more than 90. And the Venezuelan electoral system is the best system of those 90. It's the best, it's the um, most accurate system because it's based on a paper, the paper ballot, a paper trail, and it's electronic. People vote, and there is a ballot that comes out of the machine. You look at the ballot, you see who you voted for, and you sign it. And uh, by law, uh, Nearly 50% of the voting centers are audited in order to make, in order to go through those, uh, the paper trail and compare that with the electronic results, and there's never any discrepancy. So that the opposition claimed that there was fraud in 2004, and there was a rising star by the name of Maria Corina Machado. Have, have you heard of her? Absolutely. Yeah. At the time, you were there in 2006, mm -hmm. not 2004. No, um, no. I, I, she was unknown. I was there for the youth festival in 2005, too. Okay. Well, in 2004, she, nobody had no, knew who she was. She was the vice president of an NGO by the name of Sumite. And Sumite uh, claimed, on the basis of exit polls, that those results were not accurate, that Chavez did not win those elections in 2004. Well, first of all, we know that exit polls aren't particularly accurate. But in addition to that, Maria Corina Machado, of all the opposition leaders, and she since then became a political leader, of all the opposition, opposition leaders, and there are a lot of radicals among the opposition leaders, she's the most radical. In November of last year, there were elections for governor. All the political parties, even the, the, the fringe parties like uh, Voluntad Popular, whose leader is, is in jail, Leopoldo Lopez, they participated in elections. She didn't. So she's the most radical of the opposition leaders. And she's the one that said that fraud was committed in these elections. And all the parties of the opposition supported that position. So in 2013, the same thing happened. And um, Enrique Capriles, who was the candidate, uh, said to his people on television, um, you know, we won these elections. And I want you to go out and show how angry you are. The word that he used in Spanish was rechera. I'm not going to translate that. <laughs> um, because it's not, a, it's not a nice word. But 
you know, you could translate it as anger. Express your anger. The anti-Chavistas went out, and there were 11 Chavistas were killed that day and the next, that night and the next day. So I think that's important to keep in mind, that, you know, when you hear about the demonstrations of the opposition, and you hear about uh, so many deaths, these deaths, some of them are people of the opposition, but not all of them. And the opposition uh, on the streets have been very, they've been very aggressive uh, since then. Uh, actually, before then. But, but, but under Maduro, it's been a lot worse. Um, so that was in 2013. In 2014, uh, there were protests that were called civil disobedience. Uh, they lasted four months. They were referred to as the Guarimba, I think it's an indigenous word in Venezuela. Um, but it was basically f f folkism, f folkista, you know, register Bray, small groups attacking security forces, attacking the army, and that's how it was done in Cuba. That's, you know, Ch that was Chase strategy in, in Bolivia. And that's what the opposition was trying to do. They, they, they um, paralyzed uh, traffic between different cities, main intersections, main drags. And in some cases, in, in, in the, what I saw in 2017, uh, near where I live, was uh, between 3 and 10 people, day after day after day. And I saw one which was much bigger. Were, I counted, you know, about 100. So it's, they weren't all small, but a lot of them were. Uh, they, they set up barricades, fires, boulders, um, and this took place over a period of four months. Uh, during those four months, there were 36 deaths. Six of them were members of the National Guards, National Guardsmen. One or two were policemen. Uh, the civil disobedience was civil disobedience in that they were peaceful, but that's only a half-truth, because they were peaceful in the daytime. Peaceful, but with barricades, fires, blocking traffic. But that, okay, you can, depends on how you define the word peaceful. But let's say that was peaceful. But at nighttime, or as the afternoon wore on, uh, they ceased to be peaceful. They were you know, confrontation with the police. Some of those people were killed. There were excesses on the part of the, the National Guard and, and the police. But they also attacked the National Guard. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you an, an anecdote of um, when I was in Vancouver, uh, outside of Vancouver, I spoke at a university, uh, Thompson River University, and there was a Venezuelan student who was there, uh, and I talked about the same thing that I'm talking about now, about the confrontations and the deaths. There were 36 deaths in uh, 2014 and 2017, four-month period of protests. There were 130, over 130 deaths. And I mentioned that, and I went into detail, and I attempted to demonstrate that there were Chavistas, there were anti-Chavistas, and a lot of innocent bystanders who were killed. They weren't just, it wasn't just a question of police repression. And he said, he told a journalist who told me, he said, you know, there were hundreds of deaths. Well, not hundreds. I mean, 36 and 130 doesn't add up to hundreds. but. In addition to that, he said, <coughs> maybe the journalist said, well, what about the policemen who were killed? What about the National Guardsmen who were killed? And he said, no, that was retaliation. The students retaliated. It was a very interesting comment. Because that, that's what the young people who were protesting thought. And there was a class element. These protests were taking place in middle class, upper middle class, municipalities, where the mayors were anti-Chavistas, were members of the opposition. And those mayors were encouraging, in some cases, and in other cases, just letting it happen. They weren't clamping down on the protests. So, uh, both in 2014 and 2017, those protests did not resonate in the barrios. They were in middle class areas. In 2017, they spread to municipalities in which the mayor was a Chavista, but they didn't penetrate the, the slum areas. Um, 
And these middle class kids thought that maybe there was police repression. Well, then we have a right to fight back. And so the use of that term retaliate, I think, said a lot about what the protesters were thinking. What right does the police have? The police being people from the lower classes. And the guard, National Guardsmen, who also come from the lower class, because in, in, Latin, in Venezuela, unlike the rest of Latin America, much of Latin America, the military, maybe with the exception of the Air Force and the Navy, but the Army and certainly the National Guard, those people are not middle class or upper middle class. They come from the popular sectors of the population. And so these young students were saying, you know, they attacked us. We have a right to attack them. So he was telling this to the journalists, saying, well, that was retaliation, and it was justified. But you do that in the United States. Let's say there's police repression. Well, all of you probably have experienced <laughs> demonstrating. Um, you know, uh, sometimes there is police repression. But in the midst of police repression, if a protester were to take out a gun and shoot and kill a cop, everybody knows what would happen here in the States. So that um, Leopoldo Lopez, who's the main leader who has been jailed, who the New York Times compared to, compared with Martin Luther King, <laughs> uh, he was promoting the, the, the Guarimba in 2014, and he stated that the protests are going to continue until Maduro is removed from office. So people were getting killed every day, or people were getting wounded every day, and uh, day after day, he said, this is about regime change, and until it happens, uh, we are going to be on the streets. So he was jailed, and he was given a 13-year 13, 13 sentence, over 13 years. Um, but in the States, if somebody was promoting organizing and publicly identifying themselves and, 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 and leading protests that resulted in the death of policemen, that 11 years would have been a very lenient, generous uh, sentence. So uh, in, in 2017, uh, there was another incident that demonstrates how misleading the media has been when they leave the impression and they state that um, uh, Maduro is a dictator and they talk about repression uh, and they make reference to the, the, the police repression, <coughs> basically they're referring to those two incidences, 2014 and 2017. In 2017, there was an incident which everybody saw on TV because it was filmed, in which one of these protests, somebody poured gasoline over one of the protesters and they lit him on fire. Everybody went running off, including <coughs> this guy by the name of Orlando Figueroa. He survived four days. From the hospital, he said, they did this to me because they, they thought I was a Chavista because I'm a Chavista. So they did that to me because, uh, because of, for political reasons. And when he passed, when he died, his mother was interviewed, and she said the same thing. They killed my son because he was a Chavista. The New York Times, so the opposition used damage control. You know, when something like this happens, Trump is an expert at this, all the politicians are, they, they, they look for a spin which is least damaging. So the opposition came up with this. That happened because Orlando Figueroa was caught stealing something. Now, the New York Times published an article in which they made reference to this incident. And they criticized it, as they had to, like anybody would criticize. All right, the guy is a thief. Um, uh, what, you know, he shouldn't be burnt alive, he shouldn't be killed. Um, but that explanation is not at all convincing. Because, you know, I've lived in Venezuela since the 1970s. That kind of thing doesn't happen in Venezuela. It might happen in some parts of the world, I don't know. But it doesn't happen in Venezuela. And certainly on a demonstration with political banners, with political objectives, they're not going to kill somebody because he's stealing. They might punch him in the mouth, but they're not going to kill him. So any honest journalist would discard that explanation. But let's say 
the newspaper wants to present both sides of the story. So they present one side and they present the other side. But the New York Times didn't do that. The New York Times just presented the opposition's explanation and they presented it as a fact, not an opinion, as a fact. Why did they do, why did they do that? Because if they had even mentioned the possibility that he was killed in that manner because he was considered a Chavista, us people in the United States know what that is. That's hate crime. And we're very sensitive to that. Um, and that would have completely discredited, just that one incident would have completely discredited the opposition. Because this was an opposition march. This was not just a handful of people. This was a fair-sized group of people who were protesting. And they would have been completely discredited had the New York Times told the truth. So, um, uh, I think that it's important to um, talk about this. Because what the opposition does in their discourse is to conflate two things that are going on. One is the economic situation, which in Venezuela is very difficult. And they talk about that. And then they talk, they, 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 they kind of insert in the conversation violation of human rights and lack of democracy. Venezuela is a dictatorship. And then they go back to the economic situation. So if somebody isn't analytical, and most people aren't particularly analytical, they know that the economic situation is difficult, and they hear this about Venezuela being a dictatorship, and so they just kind of, you know, without questioning it, they assume that it's a fact. But it's not a fact, and it's got to be analyzed separately. You have two separate topics. Just like the topic of uh, delinquency and the topic of political repression have nothing to do with one another. They have to be separated. But the narrative of the opposition and some of the media that talk about this, they also conflate those two. So, okay, you have a problem with delinquency in Venezuela like you do throughout. I mean, we know about what's happening in Central America. But throughout Latin America, Brazil is terrible. And Mexico is terrible. I, uh, my, my wife has family members in, in many of the Mexico, which fortunately is not a dangerous place. But um, uh, somebody in my wife's family told me, you know, we can't walk down the street like this in any other city practically in all of Mexico. You know, we were walking down the street at nighttime. He said, you can't do this practically any place in Mexico, but fortunately we can do that here. So it's not just a problem that Venezuelans face, but the narrative conflates the two. And so, okay, there is a problem with delinquency. People do get, you know, held up. Uh, some of them get murdered um, on the street. And then they talk about political repression as if it's one of the same. Mm -hmm. So that is a deceptive narrative. And I think that people have to separate these different items and analyze them separately. The economic situation is very difficult in Venezuela. And that has a lot to do with the sanctions. Uh, but also has a lot to do with the decline of the price of oil that nosedived in 2014. In August in 2014, the price of oil began to decline. And Venezuelan oil, which was above $100 a barrel, uh, reached a little over $30 a barrel. Uh, at any time in Venezuelan history, uh, in the 20th century, since the 20s, uh, you would have a you would have a very very difficult economic situation because Venezuela is very dependent on the oil. Oil exporting countries, OPEC countries, are more dependent on oil than other countries are on their main pro export product. That's a characteristic of oil exporting third world countries. Uh, so it's inevitable that Venezuela be, would be affected in a big way by the decline of the price of oil. But there's a third factor that explains the economic difficulty. I believe that uh, mistakes have been committed, have been made. And uh, the Maduro government has not taken into consideration sufficiently the marketplace. You have subsidized prices 
Uh, the most blatant example is gasoline, which up until recently was green. And so you have this tremendous disparity uh, between the administered prices and the prices, the cost of production, and the price for that product in the black market. You have scarcity. Something similar to that happened in the Soviet Union. Um, and that should have been a lesson. I mean, it should have been analyzed. But what's happening in Venezuela should be analyzed. Mistakes shouldn't be um, repeated. Um, I'm not opposed to administered prices. The government uh, establishes a system in which you have prices which are artificially low for basic commodities, commodities that poor people purchase. And that system has been in effect since the 1970s, off and on, not all the time. But, well, it's, it's been in effect since the 1970s. But uh, Chavez uh, uh, extended that system. Uh, and that, I think, is viable. But when you have a big disparity, as I said before, then, for instance, state companies uh, have a hard time uh, investing because they don't have they don't make any profits. They're selling at the cost of production, or in some cases less than the cost of production. So they depend on subsidies from the from the from the state, and the state can subsidize when they have uh, revenue enough. When the price of oil is way up there, over a hundred dollars a barrel. But when the price of oil declines, the government doesn't have enough money to subsidize. So you have a situation like. Um, the telecommunications, in which I always said, look, you know, there's no reason why the state cannot run industry. Look at telecommunications, Cantavet, the telephone company. It's, you know, it's a decent service, and it was. But when the price of oil declined and the government was unable to subsidize that sector, the service uh, deteriorated. And before I left Venezuela, for instance, I went several months without without the telephone line. Myself and other people in the community where I live, no, no telephone service, and it's because of that. So that that is you know one criticism that I have of the Maduro government. Um, Chavez might have done things differently. I don't know, but uh, that is part of the explanation for the economic difficulty. So I I would say, and I say in my presentations, that there are three factors that explain. The economic difficulties. And basically, the three factors uh, have more or less the same weight. You know, let's say 33% in each case. The price of oil declining, the economic war against Venezuela, the sanctions of the Trump administration, the, the executive order of Obama, uh, that has had a big impact, and the mistakes that have been made by the government. That's quite different from the narrative of the Trump administration that, and the opposition in Venezuela that basically says that Maduro is incompetent, that um, he's responsible for the economic difficulties. The opposition in Venezuela says, sure, the price of oil has declined, but that has nothing to do with the economic difficulties that we face. Yes? Can you repeat, can you repeat those three factors, oil prices? Yeah, uh, the economic war of the sanctions and the um, efforts of the U.S. government, even before Trump, to discourage investments in Venezuela, to discourage tourism in Venezuela, uh, that has had a big impact on the economy. And the third is the errors that have been committed with regard specifically to the market, the importance of the market. Because, and here's another thing that's worth mentioning, Venezuela is a capitalist country. 80% of the economy is private. And so it may be that uh, Maduro has kind of a, a dogmatic mindset. I mean, he's an all-time leftist. He was a street fighter, you know, a street organizer for the left since he was in his teens. Um, he belonged to um, uh, one or two parties that might be considered you know, pretty far to the left. So maybe he underestimates the importance of the market. Uh, there's a controversy among Marxist economists with regard to the market. With regard to the market, some economists say that the economy is not uh, um, intrinsic to, to capitalism, 
that there's nothing incompatible between market and socialism. That's a debate among Marxist economists. But the fact of the matter is that Venezuela isn't, isn't socialist. It's capitalist. And when the right says that what's happening in Venezuela demonstrates that socialism doesn't work, uh, they lose sight of the fact that uh, maybe, it doesn't, maybe the economy is in the situation that it's in precisely because it is capitalist, not because it's socialist, because it isn't. So, were you, were you going to say something? Yeah, you said uh, that uh, Chavez might have uh, done that differently than Maduro. How, what, 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 what would maybe he have done to eliminate that factor as much as he did? Well, okay, th that's a good question because uh, I believe that one of the lessons of these 20 years is that any government that wants to bring about far-reaching change is going to uh, uh, confront vested interests, mm -hmm. powerful economic interests, internally supported by the foreign governments, <coughs> the United States and other governments. cold when I was in Winnipeg, because nobody except my wife told me that the Winnipeg, Canada is cold. <laughs> I didn't listen to my wife. <laughs> uh, next time I'll know better. Um, so there, there are moments in which it's difficult uh, to make bold moves um, and try to correct situations. Corruption is one example. Um, deepening the process of change. Um, correcting bureaucracy. Uh, um, you know, making the, bureaucrat the, the, the government less bureaucratic, more efficient. Um, striking out at the enemy. Um, making decisions which are difficult, for instance, I mentioned the price of gasoline, increasing the price of gasoline. You know, here in the States, we say, well, gasoline is free. We know what, how much gasoline costs. But in Venezuela, there is the feeling that Venezuela produces oil, and we have a right to have cheap gasoline. And when the government, the neoliberal government of 1989, increased the price of gasoline, there were disturbances that resulted in thousands of deaths, known as the Caracaso. So it's not easy in Venezuela. So one of the lessons is you have to wait for the right moment in order to do these things. Even corruption. You might even think, you know, corruption. You should be against corruption all the time, and it doesn't matter what the economic situation is in the country or what have you. You know, strike out against corruption. But even corruption is much more complicated than people think, because for each corrupt person in the government or wherever they are, there are 20 accomplices who would never consider themselves Accomplices. But they're compadres. How do you translate that? Compadres. They're, um, they've got some kind of kinship relationship. Good, good buddies. They're good buddies, okay. Uh, and they're, they're family, you know, cousins, primos, uh, or friends, and, or colleagues. So that it's not easy. I know from my university, many, many years in my university that uh, it's, not, it's not easy. So you have to, timing is essential. Chavez uh, learned from that experience. Because in 2002, he was overthrown. He came back two days later. And he reached out to the opposition. In fact, the <coughs> night that he returned, he pleaded with the opposition. He pleaded with the media. Look, at this is one country. We're all in this together. And that was a mistake. That was a mistake. Because one person that he allowed to return to the state oil company, who he had fired, plotted the general strike that took place eight months after that. Juan um, Fernandez was, the, was one of the key people in plotting a two-month coup that attempted to bring, out, bring about regime change. And this guy 
Chavez brought back is part of this, you know, opening up. Your friend Felipe Perez Marti, Marti between Jeff and myself. Chavez brought back, brought into the government some moderates, which was okay. In the case of, yeah, that was okay in the case of Perez. But, um, it, so he learned from that experience. And um, he criticized himself. Uh, later he said, you know, I was foolish to have, to have done this because the opposition wasn't interested in dialogue. So, in 2004, he won the elections that I referred to before, so we call election. 2005, early 2000, January 2005, he defined himself as a socialist. He took advantage of victories in order to deepen the process of change, in order to achieve certain objectives. In 2006, as I mentioned a while back, he won elections with the highest percentage of votes in modern democratic history. Right after that, he created a new party, the PSUV. He nationalized all these companies that I mentioned, um, uh, telecommunications, electricity, steel was a year later, cement. All these companies were nationalized. He took advantage. And oil was also somewhat nationalized. Uh, so he took advantage of having the upper hand. And then he lashed out at corruption. In 2008 or 9, he jailed the brother of his right-hand man, Jesse Chacon, Arne Chacon. The two of them had participated in the coup, in one of the coups in 1992, with Chavez, in favor of Chavez. So these guys were his buddies. And Arne Chacon was, uh, was corrupt. I mean, he had been a Chavez, but he was corrupt. He, was, he became a banker. And Chavez uh, jailed him. He jailed uh, Fernandez Parueco, who helped Chavez during the two-month general strike. He, got, he was in transportation, and he was opposed to the general strike. But he was corrupt, and he was thrown in jail. So after Chavez died, the Foro de Sao Paulo, I don't know if some of you have heard, the Sao Paulo Forum, it's a Latin American uh, umbrella organization of Latin American leftist parties and movements. And they met in, in Caracas, you know, after Chavez, right after Chavez died, um, to pay their tributes. And in a meeting which was televised, which I saw on TV, uh, Alvaro uh, Garcia Linera, who was the vice president in Bolivia, sitting right across from Maduro, looking at Maduro in the eyes, said, a revolution that doesn't move forward, that doesn't take advantage of situations of momentum, is a revolution that's going to be defeated. I mean, th these are my words, but this is basically what he said. And I think that that's the lesson. And Maduro didn't listen, because Maduro in, um, okay, who was elected president with a very small margin. You could say that he was on the defensive because he won with only one or two percentage points. But in December of 2013, he won the municipal elections with 11.5 percentage points. That was, the, that was the moment to have done something about correcting these problems, such as this disparity between administered prices and the black market. I mean, he would have taken a beating. The opposition would have gone on in the streets. They would have protested. But he had the upper hand in that moment. That was the moment to do it. When you're on the defensive, you can't do that kind of thing. So after he defeated the Guarimba in 2014, that was another moment to have taken advantage of the situation. And apparently he was going to do that. Maduro announced in July that Guarimba ended in April or May. And I think it was in July that he announced a major shakeup of his cabinet. In Spanish, it's called El Gran Sacodon. That's the term that he used. That was his term. And everybody thought, wow, he's going to make some major changes, um, which means major changes in policies. Then he announced that he was going to put it off. He put it off for a month. I think he put it off twice. And when he finally announced this great shakeup, it was like musical chairs. It was as if each one of us just changed from one chair to another. 
one minister going over to, with one exception, the oil industry, uh, the head of the oil industry, the minister and president of the oil company, he was, um, uh, he got another position that was eventually forced out. But, you know, so I don't think that Maduro, uh, I think that's one of the Maduro's mistakes. Uh, he's not bold. He's bold on the political front. He's done some bold things that were successful, to my surprise. But with regard to economic policy, he hasn't made necessary changes. But those changes were not easy. And some of the, um, even the Chavistas, I don't know, um, there's a guy, an excellent economist, person that I know personally who's really good, uh, Mark, Mark Weisbrot. Some of you might have heard of his name. He's got an NGO in Washington. Good guy, um, and he does excellent work. He's very prolific. But he sometimes gives that impression that all you have to do is decree, decree the elimination or the virtual elimination of these administered prices. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. And that's why Maduro has to wait for the right moment. But timing is everything. And th that's, you know, my answer to your, your question with regard to Chavez. So, um, I think that in order to be successful in um, solidarity work, uh, either conversations with people who want to know more about what's happening in Venezuela and have read the corporate media and uh, have a completely negative impression, um, that it's not enough to talk about the sanctions per se. The sanctions have done a lot of harm. But you get it into um, uh, shaky grounds if you say, well, I'm opposed to sanctions as a matter of principle. Because somebody can say, well, what about the sanctions against South Africa, the anti-apartheid sanctions? Um, well, that was, uh, that was approved by the United Nations. These sanctions are unilateral sanctions. And they go, in, go against the UN international law, the OAS. Um, so they're illegal by international law. But even still, if somebody said, well, what about Pinochet? Would you have opposed sanctions against Chile? You know, the, the argument is that sanctions hurt everybody. And they, they've had a devastating effect in Iraq, in Iran. Uh, and so, you know, they're really not effective, but, you know, are they legal, are they illegal if they're approved of by an international organization? Would they be justified? So, it seems to me that there's another um, area that is essential in any discussion about um, the sanctions of the Trump administration. And that is that you cannot justify sanctions against a country because there are economic difficulties. Other countries in Latin America, certainly in Africa, have economic difficulties. Trump could not say, I'm opposed to the economic policies of such and such a country, therefore I'm going to impose sanctions. I mean, that's not going to cut ice. So the, what I said before, the, con the conflating of the economic situation and the state of Venezuelan democracy. So it seems to me that Venezuelan democracy, the, the, the fact that Venezuela has had elections, you don't have electoral fraud in Venezuela. Um, sometimes, usually the opposition doesn't even use that word. When they do, usually they, they're talking about the fact that it's not an even, uh, it's not a level playing field, that the government has more time on the state TV channel than the opposition candidates. Uh, and the electoral law uh, gives the opposition candidates more time, and that hasn't been respected. And some of that is probably true. Some of that is true, and some of it is probably true. But, you know, I don't have to talk about the United States with regard to gerrymandering, the Electoral College, felons or ex felons who don't have the right to vote, um, uh, the voter suppression. So let's face it, no democracy is perfect. And the 
dean of political science here in the United States, Robert Dahl, said, and he wasn't, he was certainly not a leftist, uh, his famous book, by the way, it's called Who Rules New Haven? Because it's an, he was a professor at Yale and he analyzed democracy in Yale and he said, you know, democracy, it's not a democracy, it's a polyarchy. That's the term that he used, polyarchy. <coughs> We have pluralism in the United States because different factions of the <coughs> class compete against one another. So that was his definition of democracy. And um, uh, other Marxist or neo-Marxist political scientists like Ralph Miliband demonstrated that that's false. That the ruling class, firstly, um, it, one thing is the elites, the other is the ruling class, the economic ruling class. And here in the United States, um, you might have competition between the Democratic and the Republican Party, but that's very limited. So the pluralism, which is what the school of Dahl is known as, uh, can be questioned. So if you say that you know, you've got mistaken economic policies in Venezuela, you have an economic crisis, that doesn't convince anybody to support sanctions. So you have to talk about the fact that you don't have uh, uh, you don't have electoral fraud in Venezuela, and you don't have the kind of repression that the corporate media is talking about. Uh, so that's part of it. But the other part of it, and I'll kind of sum up with, with this last discussion, um, is that there are positive aspects of the Maduro government that has to be recognized. And I consider this to be important because there, there are a number of people on the left who, being leftists, they naturally don't support a military intervention in Venezuela. They don't support sanctions against Venezuela. But they basically take a position that the Maduro government is as bad as the opposition. It's a plague on both your houses type approach. Um, and if you read what they say, and one, one, one of those people is somebody else who I admire very much. He's been around for a long time. In fact, I had to read one of his books when I was in graduate school. Uh, some of you might have heard of him, James Petrus. Has anybody heard of James Petrus? Mm -hmm. He writes, uh, he's very prolific. Well, okay. He uh, takes his position. Um, so I, I've, I've read enough of these um, people, both uh, non-academic and academic writers, uh, who are basically le progressive, leftist, pro-leftist, <coughs> and some, like Petrus, Marxists, and they omit important things about what's going on. For instance, they talk about the social programs, and they say, well, that's good, because the government distributes certain goods and services to the poor people. But they leave it at that. And the fact of the matter is that these social programs in Venezuela go way beyond doles or subsidized products because they, they involve the incorporation of marginalized sectors of the population, not, even the, not only the working class, but the marginalized sectors, the people who work in the informal economy, the people who don't have steady jobs, the street vendors, basically. Uh, or people who work in very, very small companies <coughs> which uh, aren't legally registered. Uh, or companies that have less than 10 employees. So they're semi-marginalized. But they don't have union leadership. And in a lot of cases, they, are, they don't have the same protection under labor law that workers in the formal economy have. And workers in bigger, because the, the labor law before Chavez made a distinction between companies with less than 10 workers and companies with more than 10 workers. So uh, the system of community councils, of communal councils, which Chavez created in 2006, you have these communal councils throughout Venezuela in the barrios. And at assemblies, the people decide collectively you don't have a president of the communal council. You don't have somebody leading the community. You have uh, what they call spokespeople. 
but that you don't have a president, you don't have somebody in charge. <coughs> and the people in these assemblies choose the priority public works project or projects. And they solicit funding, city, state, or federal government. They oversee the carrying out of those projects. They insist that workers in their communities get, get hired, be it uh, bricklayers, electricians, plumbers, that they, they get preference in the hiring process. And um, in a lot of cases, the money goes directly to the communal, to the communal council. So they're the ones that are involved. This involves incorporation, participation, empowerment, and that's all embodied in the Constitution, the Chavez Constitution, <coughs> that was passed in a national referendum, first time in Venezuelan history. That, uh, Venezuela has had a lot of constitutions in its history. It's the first time that there was a referendum on whether or not to draft a new constitution. That was a few months after the Ch Chavez was elected president. And then in December of 1999, they had a, a, a referendum to decide whether that constitution would be approved. And, that, and it was approved by a massive vote. So the, the constitution uh, uh, promotes this idea of participatory democracy. Uh, that in Venezuela is a new term. I'm familiar with it, and you are too. Remember SBS? Yeah. That goes back. But in Venezuela, I mean, this idea that the people decide. Um, and that is um, expressed through the system of referendums that I mentioned, the recall election. We don't have that in the States. We have it uh, in the... Um, yeah, we, 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 we have it in some states. I don't know about Oregon, in California, Connecticut, uh, but not uh, nationwide. If we had it nationwide, we could have a recall of Trump. That, that, that could be a possibility if we got enough signatures and we certainly would be able to get it. Uh, or a recall on specific policies with regard to immigration, with regard to any issue. That is in the Constitution of Venezuela, and that has been carried out. There have been a number of referendums in Venezuela on the Constitution, a reform of the Constitution, and the recall election. So the positive sides have to be brought out. The nationalization. The opposition will say, but these state companies are being poorly managed. Okay, that's true. It's uh, unfortunately true. But just the fact that the state nationalized strategic sectors of the economy <laughs> That is significant unto itself because that can be compared to one of the most important events in Latin American history in the 20th century, which is the nationalization of the oil industry in Mexico in 1938. That is an emblematic um, uh, event. All Mexicans know about this. I mean, Lopez Obrador, who was just elected president, I was just. <coughs> reading a, a book that was published in English, I was surprised, uh, 2018. Uh, and he attacks privatization. He's glad to see that. Uh, and he says, you know, we privatized um, the telephone service, and it's deficient. We, tele we privatized the, ra the railroads, and it's very deficient. And he uh, opposes the privatization of oil, which is, um, and he supports the um, construction of six uh, oil refineries to produce oil, uh, to produce gasoline in Mexico instead of importing gasoline. Well, all this really is a continuation of something that happened in 1938. Everybody knows in Mexico that Pemex is very poorly managed. But nobody in Mexico is going to say that was a mistake to nationalize oil because look at Pemex. I don't think anybody's saying that. Or at least I'm sure that the vast majority of Mex Mexicans consider that to be a really important event in Mexican history. So that's something that has to be emphasized. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is foreign policy. Um, these other things that I mentioned have positive aspects and negative aspects. But foreign policy, in my mind, is just positive. There's no downside. Because the uh, promotion of Latin American unity, Latin American integration, 
uh, uh, Chavez, more than any other leader, but with the support, the active support of Lula, Kirchner, Morales, the um, Latin America really united. They created UNASUR, which is a, an organization of South American <coughs> countries that played a very important role in different crisis situations in Bolivia and Ecuador. The, if it wasn't because of that, the United States would have stepped in. I mean, the United States, you know, as a peacemaker, quote unquote. But um, there's a long-standing dispute in Latin America uh, between those who favor Pan-Americanism that takes in the United States and Canada and Latin American unity. So Chavez promoted Latin American unity with UNASUR, and set with CELAC, which takes in all of Latin America, with ALBA, which takes in the more leftist uh, Latin American countries like uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, though I don't know where that stands now, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and some Caribbean, two or three Caribbean nations. So uh, that uh, was promoted by, by Chavez. Petro Caribe was another initiative uh, for the for providing oil uh, with special credit terms for countries in the Caribbean as well as Central America. So that, um, you know, I think you really have to um, phrase what you say depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody on the right, you come up with some, if you, if you can have decent conversations. And some people on the right, you can't. You can sit down and talk, they listen express the opinion, uh, but I have learned that you have to distinguish, <coughs> distinguish between people who are uh, not civil uh, and people who are decent and you can talk to. But you use certain, you know, arguments with them, certain arguments with people who are influenced by the corporate media but aren't necessarily defined in terms of the political spectrum. But when you're talking to people on the left who say, look, I'm opposed to the sanctions, um, or you talk to people and there's a growing body, and this is very important, of centrists, people who I call centrists, in other words, Obama, Hillary Clinton, the New York Times, their position is that Trump should not promote a military coup in Venezuela. He, the New York Times is opposed to military intervention. But the New York Times, or at least Wall Washington Office on Latin America and others who are associated with that body of opinion, they're opposed to military intervention and they have heated debates with the right. David Smiley, who's the main uh, expert of WOLA, uh, he has had very heated debates with the right and the right attacks him as they attack people on the left uh, because he's opposed to military intervention. But he says, Military intervention isn't going to work. We need more sanctions. So it seems to me that the issue of military intervention and the issue of sanctions, which have done so much harm to Venezuela in terms of um, prohibiting financial institutions from uh, purchasing bonds so that Venezuela cannot refinance its public debt, prohibiting Citgo, which Citgo, which is a 100% Venezuelan-owned oil company, it has been deprived of, it's been estimated, a billion dollars. It cannot remit its profits to the Venezuelan government. That's one of the sanctions of the Trump administration. Um, these sanctions uh, uh, have to be opposed. And uh, I think that the argument has to be that there's a war going on. And it's not just an economic war, it takes in much more. The threat of a military intervention, that's not economic, but there's a war against Venezuela. And that war has to be opposed. So the military intervention has to be opposed, but the sanctions also have to be opposed because it's a form of warfare. You know, uh, the uh, sanctions against Iran just went into effect. And it's really outrageous what the Trump administration is doing because 
the Europeans are opposed to the sanctions. They, the European nations support <coughs> Obama's agreement with Iran. But the United States, so they're, they're talking about using other currency. Um, but Shell and uh, uh, Total, which is a um, French company, I just read this in the New York Times, I believe the New York Times, uh, I just read it today, they um, are not importing oil from Iran because they're afraid, I mean, these are two European companies, why are they affected by the Trump decree? They're afraid that if they do that, their funds will be frozen in U.S. financial institutions. And this is exactly what's happening to Venezuela. That these sanctions are causing financial institutions in Europe. Uh, there was $1.6 billion that was earmarked for um, the purchase of food and medicine that was frozen in a clearinghouse in Belgium uh, uh, precisely because of the, of the same reason. Um, and so the sanctions have to be opposed. And it seems to me that when you're arguing with, with these people who say uh, military intervention, no, sanctions, yes, or people on the left who are opposed to both, it's not enough to say these sanctions don't work or they violate international treaties or international law. Uh, you have to say they don't work because, you know, Venezuela uh, uh, is a country that should be supported, and that it should be supported for good reason. They've done some important things under Chavez that Maduro is preserving. Maduro is not uh, undoing the policies that, uh, that uh, Chavez implemented. Uh, and so that, I think, is the argument that has to be used in that kind of discussion. Thank you. in Venezuela, and one of the things that we were quite aware of was the involvement of the CIA in interventions all over South America previous to that, and there was discussion with, and particularly we were, we were, we were a labor delegation, uh, mostly, and uh, so we were concerned with the AFL-CIO's complicity with the CIA, and my question is, since 2006, do you, are you aware of this, the AFL-CIO, which is the Labor Federation of yeah. the U.S., being involved with the CIA in intervention in Venezuela? Yeah, I, I have to say that I, I, I don't have information. You know, the, the AFL-CIO, through the solidarity, the organization solidarity, <laughs> the, the main trade union confederation in Venezuela is the CTV, historically speaking, not now. Uh, it goes back to 1937, they, I'm sorry, 1947, they say it goes back to 1936. Um, but they were the main confederation and they supported the coup. The president of the CTV uh, supported the coup against Chavez in April. And the general strike, which is a misnomer because it was really a lockout, it was uh, promoted by the Chamber of Commerce, Fede Cabras. You know, I mentioned before that the president of Venezuela in April, after when the coup took place, was the president of the Chamber of Commerce. And when the general strike took place in Dece beginning December of the same year, uh, the president of the Chamber, of the next president of the Chamber of Commerce, um, Carlos Fernandez. Uh, yeah, I made a mistake when I was talking about the, the oil person. His name is Juan Rodriguez. Carlos Fernandez um, was really the key person in promoting that. But the CTV and Carlos Ortega, the head of the CTV, he was on TV every day saying, you know, one more day. This strike is going to continue. They said, un dia mas, one more day. And they, they were on TV day after day for two months. Um, Ortega... 
uh, is a social democrat, he belongs to AD, and they have had historical ties with the FLCIO and so, uh, uh, so solidarity was very much in, you know, involved um, in, in that. And that was um, really, um, there's a very good article that was published in The Nation by a guy named Tim Woolworth or something like that. I can get, I can get his last name. Uh, it talks about the Solidarity's uh, actions in support of the CTV in, in 2002. Right, so we, we did some research on that, but I'm talking more recently. Now, I, I, yeah, I apologize. I don't really have information about more recent developments. But what I can say is that after the general strike, the CTV was completely discredited. And ex-CTV leaders, including the, uh, the guy that was elected president of the Oil Workers Federation, which is the most important uh, federation in Venezuela, a guy by the name of Rosales, uh, and the head of the employees uh, uh, federation, and the head of the, the president of the Metro, Torrealba. Um, they were not leftists. They were in Copay, which I mentioned before, is a conservative party. Um, but the CTV was so discredited that they went over to the Chavistas, and the Chavistas created a new confederation, the UNT, um, and the CTV was completely marginalized, and it is to this very day. So I, I can't really talk about this AFL CIO, but I can say that the organization that they supported is practically non-existent. You know, very, 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 very well. Their people really don't have any uh, influence at all in Venezuelan labor. I have a couple questions. Um, one, what do you think the um, likelihood that the cryptocurrency that Venezuela has created the Petro will help? Um, how do you feel that the election of Bolsonaro uh, might impact Venezuela? They yeah. have a full on fascist yeah. uh, as president. And then, have there been any successful attempts to try to shift the economy, the Venezuelan economy, off? from being so dependent on oil? Um, okay, well, three <laughs> very good questions. Um, with regard to the cryptocurrency, uh, Venezuela has attempted to sidetrack these things in which the Venezuelan government can't, um, you know, do anything vis-a-vis -vis Venezuelan, the uh, U.S., Financial, financial institutions, and as I said before, that, that really affects uh, uh, currency, anything, anything with financial institutions, even European ones, which are afraid of doing anything that may result in retaliation on the part of the U.S. government. So uh, the Maduro government attempted to get around that by uh, creating a cryptocurrency, which unlike all cryptocurrencies, uh, is backed by something concrete. It's like Red and Woods, in which the dollar became the international currency. Before that, it was the, Euro, the, the, the pound in the 19th century. And so, unlike or against the advice of, of Keynes, the United States insisted that the dollar be the international currency. And it was backed by gold and silver. <coughs> silver. And, and that functioned not because people went to banks or went to governments, or the U.S. government, Fort Knox, uh, but because people just knew that behind the dollar there was gold and silver. So just, just that uh, created a degree of confidence. And so the idea is that the cryptocurrency, each uh, petro, is worth one barrel of oil, which you know presently is $60. So that's what the government says. It's basically $60, but it's, it's not $60. It's one barrel of oil. Um, one of the sanctions against Venezuela dictated by Trump is that no U.S. citizen uh, and nobody living in the United States can uh, purchase petrol. So it remains to, to be seen 
whether or not that's going to be successful. But I think the important thing is that um, this is an attempt. This is an honest attempt to uh, find a way out of this terrible predicament because international transactions don't take place, uh, you know, uh, Bolivar uh, Euro or Bolivar in Yen or any other currency. They go through financial institutions, just like credit cards. You, you don't, most people don't pay in cash, they use credit cards. Well, credit cards involve financial institutions. Um, and financial institutions are afraid of dealing with the Venezuelan government and even Venezuelans in general. Um, so that's the purpose of the Petro, to get around that restriction. Um, with regard to Bolsonaro, I uh, consider that to be uh, a very, very dangerous situation. And I say that because Venezuela is surrounded by hostile governments. It's not like when Chavez was in power. And this incidentally, um, people who say, you know, I'm Chavista, but Maduro doesn't get anything right. The fact of the matter is that Chavez had oil above $100 a barrel, and he had uh, friendly countries throughout Latin America, the so-called pink tide in Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil. But all those countries are now rightist governments. But even those rightist governments uh, have not supported uh, Trump's support for a possible military solution. And when Luis Almagro, who is the most outrageous uh, Secretary General of the OAS, because, I mean, you talk about overreach. He is the Secretary General of an organization that represents all of Latin America. And, I mean, he, he talks about military intervention. Uh, he is, I mean, the opposition, the radical opposition in Venezuela could not say anything differently from what he's saying. Um, his hostility towards Ven the Venezuelan government has no limits. Um, he stated that the military option should be on the table. And the members of the Lima group, which take in these Latin American countries, which are anti-Maduro, as well as the United States and Canada, they signed a statement saying that they are not in agreement with Almagro. They do not support military intervention in Venezuela. The United States and Canada, of course, didn't sign that, but the Latin American countries did. And Bolsonaro, he's got a son who talks about you know, military intervention in Venezuela. Uh, Bolsonaro says he's going to break diplomatic relations with Venezuela. So it seems to me that that could change the balance of forces. I mean, you know, as right-wing as these countries are, and as right-wing as the Trump cabinet is, you know, we learned that there are some moderates in the Trump I, put, I say that facetiously. The Tillerson was a moderate. Mm -hmm. The Haley. Haley, Nikki Haley, who went to Colombia, who, who outside of the United Nations, in the United Nations Plaza, was rallying people uh, in opposition to Maduro, who was in the UN, <coughs> speaking in the UN, and there was a protest of, you know, Venezuelans in the UN Plaza, and she was there rallying them. I mean, that doesn't seem very moderate to me, but she is now being called a moderate. So maybe uh, next to Bolton and Pompeo, maybe she is a moderate, I don't know. But the Latin American countries are moderates compared to Bolsonaro. And that's why I consider his election to be very dangerous for Venezuela and all of Latin America. And with regard to oil dependency, that is definitely a criticism of these leftists who are very much anti-Maduro, and some of them are critical of Chavez, saying that really nothing has been done to overcome the dependence on the oil. And they, they say, some of them say that the social programs, even though they were beneficial for the poor people, were really somewhat a blessing in disguise because they uh, justified extractivism. They justified um, exploitation and continued dependence on the export of uh, minerals and basic commodities, primary commodities such as soybeans that have done you know, a lot of harm ecologically and means 
the kind of dependence that Latin America had even before the import substitution stage. Uh, uh, Svampa, uh, a Brazil, a, an Argentine political scientist who teaches in, in uh, Ray Bredet, who's a, um, uh, one of these people who have this approach of a plague on both your house, coming from the left, but she attacks Maduro and she attacks the other pink tide countries. Um, that's, that's what she says and others say. Uh, Godinas, Eduardo Godinas is another. There's a whole school there. It's known as neo-extractivism. And that's what they say, that uh, this dependence on the export of a single commodity uh, is very, um, <coughs> has done a lot of harm <coughs> economically and from an ecological viewpoint. And the social programs justify that because the money for the, for the social programs come from those commodities, the export of those commodities. Well, what they're saying is true with regard to the dependence. That dependence has not been lessened. And, you know, it's, it's true. In the case of Venezuela in particular, Venezuela is as dependent on the oil as it, as it ever was. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a knotty issue. It's not black and white. You just can't decree overcoming that dependence. Because overcoming the dependence means prioritizing <laughs> economic development, economic diversification. When Chavez was elected president, uh, he realized that he had to get the active backing of the popular sectors of the population. He had the media completely against him. He had the church hierarchy. He had the United States. He had the business sector. He had practically everybody against him. He depended on the active support of the people. So he prioritized social programs. And he downplayed the importance of economic development. So it's true. He didn't take effective measures to overcome dependence on the oil. But there were good political reasons for the emphasis on social programs. thinking about Naomi Klein's you know, shock doctrine. So what we've essentially done, you know, economically and politically, is withdrawn all economic support from a country that we had very deep relationships with and caused instability, which will then be used as the excuse for more sanctions and more withholding Not, not, as, not at all. The um, sanctions uh, creates, it, it's a type of warfare. And everybody knows that war and democracy are basically, inherently, practically by definition, incompatible. I mean, we know that from the Civil War. The people who tried to, who assassinated Lincoln, some of them were not, not, not Booth, but some of the people who were involved in the planning uh, thought that Lincoln was a dictator. Eugene Debs was you know, thrown in jail during World War I, the Jehovah's Witness in the, in the, the concentration camps of the, of the Japanese in World War II. I mean, it's just incompatible. And so it becomes somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Those sanctions creates a situation in which uh, Maduro has to centralize power, it depends more on the military. Uh, and so that uh, can be an excuse to impose more sanctions. The, the other thing is that these sanctions are doing a lot of harm to the United States in terms of what people are saying about the United States. I haven't done a study of this, but this is a sense that I have. 
Um, the sanctions on Iran, uh, the Trump administration has made some exceptions for some countries like Japan and India. Uh, they are given the right to engage in uh, imports well defined by the United States, what they can import, what they can't import. That's really outrageous. You know, who assigned the United States the right hmm. to decide what Japan and what India can import and what they can't import? And why, why Japan and India? Why not other countries that, that depend on, on oil, or might, countries that might even be poorer and more dependent on, on oil than those two countries? So the United States decides by decree. And that, I think, the sense that I have is, you know, uh, I think a lot of people in, the, in Washington say it doesn't matter if they hate us as long as they respect us. And I think, I, I mean, I really think, I'm not just saying that facetiously, that um, th there's a logic there. We want countries to uh, respect the dollar, you know, to, to use the dollar. We don't want countries to use other currencies. And if they're afraid of us, then they will continue to um, use the dollar for international transactions. And, um, but there's a limit. There's a limit. And, and, and I think that this just exacerbates a tendency that's been going on for a long time. Uh, that, you know, people aren't stupid. They say, you know, what right does the United States have to say, okay, Trump can decide for the United States, but what right does he have to decide for the world? Um, so, uh, does anybody here read Teen Vogue? <laughs> anybody what? Teen Vogue. Uh, I didn't know this until recently, um, which is why I picked up the particular, uh, month that I did at the checkout stamp, but uh, somebody had told me that Teen Vogue has gone totally... Yeah, keep the lock. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I was like, I gotta check this out. Um, the articles are like two paragraphs long, but, um, but there's a lot of, um, you know, social justice content in there. Anyways, in the particular, the only, um, uh, Teen Vogue I've picked up, um, in my life, uh, there was an article, um, by, there was an interview with Paris Jackson, who is, I guess, I didn't remember this, uh, Michael Jackson's daughter. And, um... Interesting little, very short interview. And the one uh, political issue that she's highlighting with the world is how bad things are in Venezuela and how we got to do something about it. Yeah. Um, which, the, you know, like I said, the, the, it was really sh the articles are short. Um, <clears throat> but it seemed to be that she was lining up with the, you know, student opposition kind of typical line. Um, I feel like most people in the U.S. are exposed to the, most Venezuelans who are leaving Venezuela are opposition. And um, the folks that I know who are Venezuela that 10 years ago were supporting the Bolivarian circles and all that, um, they don't engage as much anymore in support of the government. It feels a little harder to do that. And so the actual Venezuelan folks that I feel like have the mic are really and are really loud are, like you said, conflating a lot of issues. But it's hard to credibly refute that um, without, I mean, people quote facts that I'm confident, you know, things that are going on in Altamira that I'm like, nah, that didn't happen. <laughs> but um, it's hard to dispute those, those facts. So... It feels really like a generic convers, like a, I feel like not a great ambassador, right. um, because of that. So you, I feel like you've given a lot of reasons um, that make sense for certain conversations, but for like generally shifting the debate, yeah. it feels really hard and stacked yeah. against us. Yeah, I agree. Um, firstly, what you said about the Circulos Bolivarianos, uh, it is true that. There is not as much, you know, gung-ho support, enthusiastic support, um, than before. Keep in mind that the Chavistas have been in power for 20 years, you know, and there is a natural erosion of enthusiasm in any context, in any organization, in any cause. I mean, that is, 
is to be, <coughs> is to be expected. Um, that's not to minimize the difficulties that Venezuela is currently facing, but just you know, considering 20 years, um, so that the mobiliza mobilization capacity, Maduro still has you know substantial mobilization capacity. People get out there, uh, but it is true that um, the Chavistas are not as enthusiastic as they were under Chavez. That's that's a fact. Um, with regard to what you said about um, the, the, the statement about, you know, we have to support Venezuela, you know, that, that's where the issue of democracy is crucial. Because if she was saying, look, the situation in Venezuela is deplorable, we have to do something. Well, if she just left it at that, you know, the solidarity, um, the, 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 the um, uh, famous renowned singers who had a concert about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, solidarity for the poor people throughout the world. If it was just that the economic situation in Venezuela is difficult, is difficult, then she would be saying, yes, we have to provide aid for Venezuela. We have to raise money. There's a shortage of medicine in Venezuela. I mean, if that was the case with Africa, you don't know anything about politics in Africa, then the, the, the uh, narrative would have been, yes, we have to send medicine. Over it's about the Palestinian people. Certainly, people would be behind that. So you have to insist in any conversation with the opposition that, look, I don't want to talk about the economic situation because I'm in agreement with you. You're right. Although they exaggerate, let me tell you. They exaggerate. But then you have to say, it's not about economics. It's about democracy. Is there electoral fraud in Venezuela? And the only thing they're going to come up with, probably, I mean, they're capable of coming up with it, with anything. I mean, you know, you talk about fake news. How, how do you refute fake news? That's what I'm I mean, saying. That is a problem. But so it depends on who you talk to. I mentioned before that you have to distinguish between somebody who's rational and somebody you can talk to. I know on this trip, Venezuelan students have, uh, you know, asked questions and have talked to me after, after my, my tour. And some of them are quite rational. In Winnipeg, the first place that I was at, uh, I, I was really surprised at the conversation that I had with somebody afterwards. So if they're using fake news, if they're just making up things, then forget it. You're not going to convince them, obviously. But otherwise, ask them if there's there's, there is electoral fraud. If you say that Venezuela is not democratic, you say, well, in the United States, a lot of deficiencies in the United States. Two of the last three presidents have been elected president with a minority of votes, less votes than their main rival. Um, but do the votes get counted correctly? And the only thing that they're probably going to come up with is what this guy at this university that I was mentioning before <coughs> said, look, at when I voted in the ele elections, um, there was somebody who, who I know had passed away. And when I vote, when I signed the book in order to vote, I saw his name, and that guy's dead. And I said, you know, I said, look at, in those elections, you know, the elections in October of 2017, the Chavistas won in all but four states. In the states that the Chavistas won, with one exception, the state of Bolivar, they won with 10, 15 percent of the vote difference. You cannot alter an election by getting people to sign and to vote for somebody who's passed away. You show the, the identification card of that person. You're not going to change tens of thousands of votes that way. Or they say, People vote, voted twice. You're not going to have a major impact on the election because uh, people voted twice. And that's exactly what Trump said here in the United States, that 3 million people, more than 3 million people, uh, voted illegally. And he set up a commission to investigate that. And then he dissolved the commission because they didn't come up with anyone. And they did come up with four cases of four cases of electoral fraud, four people who voted twice or what have you. That's what's happened. That's what the opposition is saying in Venezuela. 
But the, so the devil is in the detail. You know, if they say, yeah, there was electoral fraud, people voted more than once, th that would be very easy to document. They have resources. I just mentioned the Chamber of Commerce, not to mention the CIA. The Chamber of Commerce, you know, supports the opposition. The opposition has all the resources in the world. If people were voting twice or three or four times on a massive scale to change, you know, uh, alter 15,000, 20,000, 50,000 votes, they would have documented that. So it seems to me that that has to be uh, brought out in any kind of conversation. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I think that uh, I, I understand what you're saying. It, it is difficult. And especially if you're talking to somebody in the opposition, and they can say, well, I've been in Venezuela. I've got that advantage. I've been in Venezuela, so I can engage a person in a conversation. I know what's a lie, and I can you know, pretty easily come up with something and say, this guy who said that he went to vote, and he saw the name of a dead person in the books, I know that's a lie. I know it's a lie. Because in each voting center, there are you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are voting. And you don't have the opportunity. They don't let you sit down and you know, go through page after page to see if you can identify somebody who you know who voted. I mean, it is said, a really good voting system. They should run the elections here. It would be better. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, you're at a disadvantage if you talk to somebody from Venezuela. But again, the devil is in the detail. But to win the campaign against sanctions, we need to have the kind of conversations you're having on scale to shift the conversation. And I just worry that, that the people who are able to have the most influence, like the Venezuelan expats, a lot of people are leaving Venezuela. <clears throat> um, and, and they're wealthier. So I don't know why the fuck Paris Jackson knows about what's going on in Venezuela. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> With all the things that there are to think about in the world. Um, hashtag Syria. Um, the, uh, it's, it's hard to influence the people who are shaping the culture. And those people are hoping to shape what our politicians care about. Yeah. Um, and so... I appreciate all of the arguments that you made today, and it really helped me understand a little more and kind of like unpack the difficult conversations that I've been having. Yeah. Like, there's one person that comes up for me. I worked with her on, she's from um, Maracay, and I worked with her on a, on a, on a campaign um, in, in, in North Carolina. We were doing union organizing together in a poultry plant. She's like a union organizer. <laughs> we, and so I've known her for years, and she is just like convinced that the whole Maduro regime is a bunch of murderers. And, um, but she is still involved in worker-centered activity in, in the states where she lives in the East Coast. I don't get it. Um, well, but I know that's well, one well, person, and that's anecdotal, well, but I know a lot of like those people. Well, I, I just yeah. gave, gave a, a yeah. some information that the U.S. media did not provide. Yeah. Six National Guardsmen were killed. Now, the Venezuelan government murders people. But what, what about the opposition? You know, they, they killed six National Guardsmen, one or two policemen. I mean, that's a concrete fact that you can use in any discussion of that nature. Thank you for coming and sure. sharing that. Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I think yeah. that is true. Say, in Portland, if six policemen were killed, yeah. I don't know if that was nationwide or in one. I mean, that would be a big deal, and there would be big repression. No Hundreds of people would be killed or, at a minimum, going to jail. Yeah. If, if six if six policemen were killed, the government would be scared, and there and there would cause big repression. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, one of the things you didn't talk about was you. Know, Chavez had all this charisma, he yeah. made so much happen, and from the U.S. not focusing that closely on Venezuela <coughs> for a long time, my sense has been that Maduro doesn't have that, at least in what we hear here, but what you're saying is that the elections, he's winning the elections, he's got power to make change. 
and the, it sounds like the critical political piece is that given how difficult things are, the economy demands really powerful change. And the question is whether he has the political um, support to make those happen. Yeah, I, I personally think that uh, he needs more support than he has uh, and that he's going to get from the, the Chavista camp because he's not nearly as popular as Chavez was. I mean, uh, he, if the opposition had united behind one candidate in his last elections, uh, Maduro would have been defeated uh, if everybody had voted. But the opposition is divided, and it's divided for good reason. I mean. Many of the Chavistas and many of the people on the left say, um, and many of the, you hear many of the Chavistas say the best thing that the Chavistas have going for them is the opposition. They're incompetent. But I, I didn't use that as an explanation. They, they, I, I, and I don't believe that any of the leaders are incompetent. They all know what they're doing. Some of them are more intelligent than others, but it's not a question of incompetence. It's that the radicals in the opposition, uh, I, be, I believe, they, they want a Pinochet type regime change. Uh, they realize that if they gain power with the economic situ situation the way it is, they're not going to be able to do much. In fact, they've said as much. They have said, the, the radicals in the opposition have said, we don't want to just win the presidential election. Uh, at one point they were talking about a, constitu a new constitution. And they were saying, we, we have to do a thorough overhaul of everything because uh, it's not enough to change the president. But really what they're saying is that they want to bring about uh, shock treatment type neoliberal change. And politically that's not going to be feasible if they don't have uh, a Pinochet type scenario. Mm -hmm. that, that's what they support, support. And there are moderates that don't support that. They're pro-neoliberal. The moderates or neoliberal, uh, Henry Falcon, who was the candidate the main candidate for the opposition in the last election wanted to dollarize the Venezuelan economy and, you know, was a neoliberal. He had been a neoliberal type uh, when he was governor uh, of the state of Lada and, and broke, broke with the Chavistas precisely because of that. He was privatizing the water system. Uh, but uh, he's a moderate. He wants, he favors, favored dialogue and he favored participating in elections. The radicals don't want to do that uh, because they perceive that the situation uh, uh, is difficult, yet, and, and it is, and their solution is shock treatment neoliberalism, which in Venezuela generated mass protests and mass disturbances, and between two and four million, a thousand people, two to four thousand people were killed in 1989. So, I mean, it's a complex situation, but uh, I believe that the solution, the most, uh, uh, most probable scenario uh, for a solution is some kind of dialogue between the moderates of the opposition and the Chavista government. And Trump is undermining that. Mm -hmm. Trump, uh, the Trump administration threatened Falcon, the main candidate for the opposition, with putting him on a list of people who are being sanctioned if he continued to run as president. And I believe that, I believe, this is my opinion, that that affected him. That even though he did run for president, his position since then has been influenced by that threat. How do I know that the Trump administration threatened him with that and he didn't do it publicly? This guy that I mentioned, Mark Weisbrot. He's been around for a long time. He, he's got an NGO. He heads an NGO, a, a think tank, actually, of economic policy in Washington. And he writes for The Guardian. He write, he's very prolific. Uh, and um, he's been writing on Venezuela since the beginning of Chavez, practically. Uh, and he wrote an article in The Guardian in which he made that statement that the Trump administration threatened Falcon, this moderate, with sanctioning him if he continued to run for president. I asked him, who gave you that information? And he told me that it was uh, uh, Rodriguez, uh, uh, Francisco Rodriguez, 
Francisco Rodriguez was Falcón's right-hand man, a U.S. banker, a very, very, he knows the ropes here in the United States a lot. I mean, he's U.S.-based, but he uh, was a, you know, the right-hand man of Falcón during the campaign and, and very articulate. And Weisbach told me that he told him, now this is Falcón's right-hand man, so obviously it's true. The Trump administration threatened uh, Falcón uh, so that obviously the Trump administration is pulling the rug out from under the moderates. And that's, that makes the possibility of some kind of dialogue, of some kind of consensus, all the more remote. What, what, why do I say that the dialogue is essential? I say that because the measures that are necessary in order to get the economy under control are going to be unpopular in the short run. It's going to create, you know, economic difficulties. Um, you know, just take the example of increasing the price of gasoline. People are not going to accept that. And uh, Maduro just tried to implement the, that recently. But the, the opposition supports those measures. But if they were implemented, the opposition would take to the streets, rally people, and politicize those measures. So that the only way to, to implement necessary ne measures that are politically unpopular is through some kind of consensus. And that consensus would be between the Maduro government and the moderates. How, why wouldn't that be capitulation, though? Why wouldn't that be, a, a, you know, the Chavez pleading the opposition again? I, firstly, you have to make a distinction between the moderates and the opposition and the radicals. Chavez called for dialogue. He called for dialogue with everybody, in, 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 he reached out to everybody in the opposition, the members of the opposition that had tried to overthrow him just, you know, shortly before that. Secondly, um, on economic policy, I believe that fiscal policy uh, is not ideologically specific that there's no correlation between being conservative on fiscal policy and implementing measures that are necessary to get inflation under control. Venezuela has hyperinflation. And it, I don't believe that measures of that nature are leftist or rightist or centrist. Now, if that negotiation was around the privatization of strategic sectors of the economy, then I'd, I'd agree with what you're saying. But I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to uh, getting hyperinflation under control. Hyperinflation means that, for instance, uh, people who get paid on a given day have to purchase everything that they need for that quincena, that fortnight, because people get paid on a basis of two, you know, two times a month. A month. <clears throat> they have to purchase everything in the next couple of days. Because by the end of the month, that the purchasing power of that money has you know, eroded tremendously. Nobody can save. You can't save anything because you know, of the purchasing power. And the, <clears throat> the interest that you get on bank loans uh, is, is uh, a pittance. So um, that's a problem that affects everybody. <coughs> What sources would you recommend um, that wouldn't be like tainted by U.S. corporate media that one could read? I didn't get your question. Oh, what sources would you recommend that aren't tainted, tainted by like U.S. Um, corporate media? Spanish would be fine. Like news sources. What sources? Would I recommend? Yeah, th there is a. Um, Internet page, which is very good, uh, and it's you know pro Chavista, but more pro Chavista than pro Maduro. So they and they cover a lot of uh, grounds, and some of the articles are critical, others aren't critical. But um, it's called Venezuela Analysis. It's spelled with one A. It's you know Venezuela Analysis, but just with one A. Uh, dot com. So that, that's one source of information. Thank you. Uh, and uh, 
Is Aporreya uh, still around? What's that? Is Aporreya still around? Aporreya is still around. This position that I mentioned before, plague on both your houses, mm -hmm. they, 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 they fit in that category. Although they're plur they also publish everything, you know, on, on the left. So it's, um, I think the uh, people who run that are, are Trotskyists. They're uh, associated with a group called Marea Socialista. Um, some of them are Trotsky, which doesn't, I don't mean to discredit them because they're Trotskyists, but uh, they tend to have a, um, a very negative opinion of, of Maduro. Um, they weren't that critical in the beginning when Maduro first, but they've become increasingly critical. So keep that in mind, but if you read Spanish, that's a good source also. Yeah? Uh, do you think Telesur is also a good source to keep up with stuff? Definitely. Yeah, Telesur is another source. Uh, you know, they have a, a page, and they're, they're, uh, but we can't access that on TV here. Uh, but that's transmitted throughout Latin America. Um, do, we, do we have a sense of um, organizing we want to do going forward? On, on this and other issues, but rather we have a bunch of different organizations we come from. Um, do we want to have some vehicle for getting together and, and seeing uh, what, what uh, steps we'd like to take to help uh, raise this awareness and we agree with Steve, uh, promote this kind of dialogue with the moderates. Does anybody have suggestions? I like to forget uh, PSL and Workers World and you folks don't get so involved in the politics to Who's the election today? Who's doing the campaign to end sanctions? Who is the organization? What, what is the organization? Oh, I guess it's a coalition of, like, like the one that <coughs> Stansfield Smith with Chicago All of Us Sol Solidarity was the one who kind of okay. led the organizing of the tour. That's a pretty small group, I think. Yeah, that's the impression that I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know much about this, this campaign. Surely we, we ought to coordinate it, but um, um, it seems to me that we would need, okay, the most immediate thing is to try to influence Congress. The step back from that is to try to invent, influence more of the people who influence Congress, uh, like maybe indivisible and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh, and back from that, a, a wider public. Uh, which I think, you know, we obviously need to be doing all those, and not just on Venezuela. But, um, but I know I'm just kind of, personally, kind of scattered in a bunch of directions, have trouble being organized on this and having the capacity to deal with it very effectively. And I'm wondering about what the rest of you think about how, how we could do that collectively. Do you want to just kind of work in your own organizations and see what you mean? Oh, something or do you have a sense? Yeah, Roy. I think definitely finding out who else is working on it. I think definitely finding out if there's other people moving on that so we could maybe coordinate with them, see where they're at. I know that Steve was mentioning a lot of things about people, you know, opposing sanctions for maybe not their exact right reasons. So trying to see where they're at as well with that. Like maybe they don't support sanctions, but they're still anti Chavista, maybe. And so to try to get a sense of what, if there is any mobilization already happening on that and what what is their analysis and uh, perspective. Uh -huh. um, and seeing it's if we could work with that or not work with that. I don't know if any of our groups particularly <coughs> taken on Venez this, these issues in Venezuela. I mean, yeah, our work has um, ties with Venezuela. But I was going to say also, I have friends and groups in Colombia that are like really focusing, especially with the election of Bolsonaro and then Duque, kind of putting... I, I might hear it slowly back, it's just a little loud. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, maybe. I have friends and groups in Colombia that will be focusing on this, and they kind of organize around like, you know, anti-US intervention, both like with sanctions and like 
his military intervention. Uh -huh. So I don't know if we wanted to like kind of try to coordinate with groups like that, like on an international scale, like to see what they're doing with that. But I mean, the positive thing about them is they're really engaged on it. Yeah. Whereas we're, 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 we've got a whole bunch of other issues we're not so very deeply engaged in and don't let, know scenarios about that. Yeah. Um, now, uh, one of the things that came out of this clearly was, well, so we want to maybe prevent attacks, but the positive thing with what, what would actually help the situation, which Steve is suggesting are these moderate and Chavista uh, dialogues together to try to work something out. Uh, I don't, you probably, you may not know what, what those folks think of that. Oh, um, not entirely. I know that a lot of them do support the government and stuff like that. There's a lot of different takes from different uh -huh. people because I'm friends with people in like the Communist Party and then people who are just in other organizations. So it, seems like, it seems like in making a case here, the fact that the, the opposition who doesn't want the dialogue, they want Pinochet. You know? I mean, if we can establish that, that really discredits them, I think with anybody who's not in the Republican Party. <laughs> and, 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 you know, proof of that is that the radicals of the opposition insist on their slogan is no to impunity. No to impunity means that all the Chavistas are corrupt. I mean, th this is the narrative. All the Chavistas are corrupt. And they have to go to jail. Because we know that that's a code for you know, repression in general. Right. Going to jail may mean, you know, things that are worse than going to jail. But the uh, president of the National Assembly, when the opposition, you know, I said that the opposition has won two elections. One of them was the elections for Congress, which is called the National Assembly. And the president of the National Assembly, who's the president of one of the major parties, his name is Henry Falcon, I'm sorry, Henry Ramos. Um, he stated, and I'm practically quoting him. He said, I hope that Maduro lives for many, many years because he has to go to jail, and I want to see him in jail for many, many years. This is typical of the narrative of the, of the, of the radical opposition. Um, and, you know, you know, we know what that means. We know what that means. And the Chavistas, I can also say, you know, on the ground, all the Chavistas, without exception, uh, even the Chavistas who begin to think, well, Maduro isn't maybe that good, he's not that effective, but they all say, if the opposition returns to power, mm -hmm. we're dead. Right. They all say that. So it's not something that's just theoretical. This is what people think, and there's good reason for why they think that. Now, uh, Jack was talking about the moderates thinking of an effective strategy here and considering that we have to prioritize and do everything, that it seems to me that one objective would be to get the so-called liberal establishment to deal with the issue, just to deal with the issue, because the issue isn't being dealt with. The New York Times published that article, but it's not really being voiced. It's the, the, the issue doesn't even come up. And it seems to me that the best way to deal with the issue uh, and, and reach people is to talk <clears throat> at first not so much about the sanctions but about military intervention mm -hmm. and to say do we want another war look at the Middle East in Venezuela there will be resistance uh, Venezuela is not Chile the military to a great extent supports Maduro to a great extent is pro-Chavista mm -hmm. it's not neutral it's, you know, some who are neutral. You're some who probably are anti-Maduro. But there's a big block of military officers who support the Chavez. And in addition to that, Chavez, who knew what was coming, created a, a militia. And so any kind of U.S. intervention is going to be a bloody affair. Do we want that? Maybe relate that to the military budget and relate that to, you know, cuts and spending for all kinds of necessary programs. So I, I think that given limited prior, uh, uh, resources, that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party should be prioritized. The Bernie Sanders types. I, th I think they should be approached. Um, the uh, supporter of Sanders 
uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio Cortez, uh, who is elected or nominated candidate in she covers the Bronx and yeah. Queen, in Queens, New York City, and she's going to win. Well, she came out with a, a very poor statement about Maduro. Uh, I think that somebody should get to her, not 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 somebody from California, but. Uh, that's an example of people who should be reached. Because she probably made that, I mean, I'm sure she's a very honest person. She convinces me of being one. So it's lack of information. So uh, reaching people like them and proposing that the issue be placed on the agenda of the Democratic Party, that, that's being discussed in the, California, the progressive corpus of the Democratic Party. Um, I won't go into detail, but I, I know that there mm -hmm. are places where that is beginning to be raised, and I think that that would be a viable strategy. Uh, yeah. And maybe maybe locally, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of us, a bunch of people who've been to Venezuela and care about it, so maybe old timers, or maybe we could get together with you folks who have these, um, you know, these connections and, and have dealt with it. Maybe we could kind of come up to speed. Maybe we could get a bunch of us who, I mean, people got limited capacity, but you've also got a lot of experience, and maybe you can help get some more of us involved. And, and together we could uh, approach something and, and get to the, I mean, it's the Bernie Sanders types. A lot of them are in this indivisible org in Florida who are working with us. And there's a Bernie PDX that's active. I would think if we if we got ourselves clear about some things and and brought some 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 real connections and possibilities, we could get some of these folks who are more closely involved with our members of Congress and either either you help get the change you want in Congress or the people who are working so hard with Congress are going to see that Congress is not so responsive, you know. So, yeah. would you have a suggestion about, about meeting about this, something like that? Um, I think that would be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, how many cities are, are you doing on this tour? Uh, I've lost count. Oh. <laughs> so, um, maybe get, get all of us together? Well, yeah, I wonder if maybe um, it makes sense to talk to Stan um, okay. and maybe try to get a call with somebody from each of the cities that did the tour to kind of debrief and think about next steps. Yeah, actually Terry Matson is probably the most Yeah, oh, she's very really good. Yeah. She's, she's in the Bay Area. She yeah, she's in San Francisco area. She's very good. Um, yeah. and Sam was organizing, but I think she's, like she made a tour and was making speeches about this herself. Great. Right. She's really politically savvy. And, and she's very disciplined. She's very, very effective. But I, 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 we're, I was talking to her uh, about this very issue and um, we kind of thought that it would be good to have a uh, a meeting of representatives from different cities in order to decide on priorities. To, you know, it's always more effective right. if something is being done nationwide. Right. Yes. So there's, there's you know one strategy. We're, we're going to emphasize work with the Bernie Sanders Democrats. So we're going to emphasize uh, such and such. You know so that it's done simultaneously throughout the country. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I think that that would be something that could be proposed. And Stan, who's the um, coordinator of my tour and has nationwide contacts, could perhaps uh, uh, bring that about. And I think Terry had also suggested, at least on an email, um, that people who've attended some of these events where you've been speaking might be on an email list that okay. Stan might. Mm -hmm. Are, are you folks all signed in here with contacts and how you want to be contacted? Like okay. um, so, um, so whether it gets organized or not, that's a possibility. So I guess maybe I should call and talk to Terry and, and ask her what, what they have in mind for how we can get together and, and we should think about having a meeting here. Should, so maybe I should get bring a report back from Terry as to what they're proposing nationwide and then they should get together. Okay. Is 
think in another week or two, something like that? I think that's a Okay. Also, I had a question. Um, I'm going to be living in Columbia for a little bit next year, and I really wanted to go on like kind of like an exposure type trip to Venezuela. Do you have any like recommendations of like how I could go about that and like specific places maybe I should go to like see what's happening there or anything of that nature? Uh, I, I would su suggest that you contact uh, Terry uh, uh, Manson. She is she 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 has a lot of contacts. She and she's been on a lot of trips to Venezuela. As far as where to go, I think it would be good to um, perhaps observe communal communal council meetings. Um, that would be one possibility, and um, to travel outside of Caracas, because a lot of people who go to Venezuela just be focused on Caracas, which is just you know one part of Venezuela. Maybe try to get to go to several different cities, and even the countryside, because one of the uh, exciting developments in Venezuela uh, is the emergence of the peasant movement, which has always existed, uh, but they're, they're more organized now, and they're more critical. They had a march. It was um, uh, called the Admirable March, after um, a march of Simon Bolivar, in the Boys for Independence. Uh, and they marched to Caracas, uh, and they wanted to meet with Maduro, and a number of Chavez leaders called on Maduro to meet with him. There was uncertainty whether that would take place, and it did. Maduro did meet with the, with these peasant leaders. Um, they, uh, some of them are representatives of communes in the country, so agricultural communes. One is called El Maisal, which has received a lot of attention, and they're they're critical of Maduro, but they support Maduro. They they have a position of support, but criticism of the bureaucracy and that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think it would be uh, good for you to try to meet with uh, representatives of the peasant movement and maybe observe some of these uh, communes, rural communes. Is that still Ezekiel Zamora, the name of the... What's that? The Frente Ezekiel Zamora. Yeah, that's the yeah. name of the, the umbrella peasant movement. Mike, the Nicaraguan we had come was um, Fausto Torres, who's a, li a leader, international director of the uh, Asociación de Trabajadores del Campo in Nicaragua, mm -hmm. a rural workers association. Yes. And they seem to have an extensive program of education and community development yes. among themselves. Yeah. I mean, and they're not part of the government. Well, this is socialism from outside of the government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, it means. It, so they form their own institution, of course. But if something smaller and something more localized offers, you know, it seems like we get these big institutions, we really screw up. Yeah. And it's, so it, that seems like a creative yeah. problem. And it sounds like what they're doing in, in Venezuela. Yeah. And there's an international organization that in Nicaragua, they, they belong to. It's called Via Campesina. Yeah. Via Campesina. It's in Spanish. It's not in it. They, I was talking to somebody in, in the Bay Area uh, who who travels to Nicaragua, she's an actor, um, and uh, she goes a lot to Nicaragua, she talks on Nicaragua. Yeah, and ATC helped found, found that. What's they, that? Were, they were a founding member of La Villa Campesina. The La Villa Campesina is a, is a coalition of these such organizations. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, that, that, so, so that would be definitely uh, Yeah, so anyhow, they're, they're having a, uh, uh, there's a delegation going January 3rd to 13th with a November 15th deadline for uh, for applying uh, to, to go to the ATC and learn about what they do and also learn about the situation, gather evidence about what really went on in this all this yeah. So if, if you're interested, uh, it's just friendsatc.org. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you all for staying so long. And uh, is everybody on the, have you all signed up here so we can send out an email to everybody?